college football nerds coming at you with the 2019 Alabama Crimson Tide preview. Got Josh in tow. We're going to get super nerdy with you on this one. We're talking depth charts. We're talking coaching, staff, turnover, schedule, all that good stuff. We might even touch on the Clemson game again a little bit. Clemson fans, don't be triggered. I um, want to remind everybody, please hit the subscribe button. And also, I was talking to my brother-in-law this weekend. He was asking me, "Why have you, when are y'all going to start doing content again? I said, uh, Richard, we've been putting out content all summer. We've done all these preview shows. You haven't seen any of them? I made him pull out his phone. I looked on his phone. And, of course, he subscribed but not hit the notification bell. So he was not getting notifications um that or he just doesn't love me i don't think that's the case richard hit the notification bell all right josh let's get into this we have beat the last game of last season to death we're not going to do it anymore we have a 37 minute video out there if you want to watch where it's like basically what the hell happened and we talk about it in that video we piss a lot of clemson fans off because we did eat a lot of crow because we picked out and win but we didn't really kind of grovel and tell them they were the greatest thing that's ever happened and you know so in this one, we want to talk a little bit about basically where Alabama is this year versus last year because a lot of people see a lot of the same faces, still in Nick Saban's system. But I want to start this discussion with just how different Alabama is both from a personnel standpoint in key positions and from a coaching staff standpoint in key positions and both of those things combined, to me, means Alabama might be scarier than they were last year. I'm not ready to slot them at number one yet, but Josh, is it possible, given this combination of new faces or returning faces on, on the depth chart and in the coaching staff, is it possible that maybe Alabama is even better than they were last year? I think it's perfectly reasonable to think that Alabama might be better than they were last season. We've certainly seen in college football that teams can be up and down. We talk about a lot in this channel. In a given year, there's no cap to how good you can be, and there's no floor. Uh, college football doesn't have any parity. There's no guarantee that teams are going to be even or that there's not going to be some team that's absurdly good. 2018 Alabama and Clemson probably win the title most years. And there's no guarantee that some team isn't going to be really, really bad. You know, there's been years like 2007 where there's a lot of chaos because there was no definitively great team. But history's already shown one team can improve year to year and a very, very good team can get even better. You know, 2002, uh, USC d goes 11-2. and two, They win the Orange Bowl. And then 2003, they win a national title, winning the Rose, going 12-1. and one. But 2003 wasn't actually their best team. It was probably 2004 when they went 11-0 and 0, won the national title again in the Orange Bowl. Um, that team, obviously, 2005, ends up losing to Vince Young. But you get the point, right? 2004 USC is a phenomenal football team. And you even though we can talk a lot about how good Oklahoma was, but they weren't good enough and Auburn should have been in, or maybe Utah should have been in. But the truth of the matter is 2004 USC is one of the best teams of the past few decades. So Alabama can improve. And I think there's reason to think they will. I mean, when you look at Alabama this year, the things that mattered the most to them were, um, you know, quality skill players in a lot of different positions. And, Last year, they really had three great receivers, two of which were banged up for much of the season. This year, I think with Waddle coming in, they really got four NFL-quality receivers. Uh, they have the same quarterback coming back. Should be more experienced and probably a lot more productive. He's going to have time to fix on the things that were going bad. Lose a first-round draft pick at left tackle, but otherwise the offensive line is going to be more experienced than it was last season. Again, you lose a first-round draft pick at running back, but he wasn't used as much as he probably should have been. And they still return, of course, being Alabama, a tremendous amount of talent at running back, even with the injury. We might touch on that later. Defensively, they weren't necessarily great last year. They're going to be healthier this season. Um, we talked about before last season, I'd heard word that Terrell Lewis was the best player on the defense, if not one of the best players on the team, not Quinnen Williams. He's the guy they lose in the ACL injury in the summer. It's him that kills the pass rush. So there's reason to believe the defense will be better, especially with Diggs coming back from injury. Um, and it looks like Job is going to be the guy to step in at corner. So all around there's things to improve. But I think the final thing is there is genuine reason to believe the coaching staff was not giving doing them any favors last season. Um, we did a you know pretty long discussion in the Alabama Clemson pre uh, post game sort of breakdown as he talked about. In my case at least in the opinion of Clemson fans, not eating enough crow. 
but I didn't need enough crow because I kind of was trying to explain why I went wrong. And I guess in a lot of people's viewpoint, explaining things or explaining the problems is, is not acknowledging that, you know, a team lost because they're deficient in every way in every position. I don't think Alabama got a lot of benefit from their coaching staff. I think they had a lot of issues with the coaching staff and the way they called plays, the way they operated the offense. I think the change in the coaching staff could be a real positive for them this season. So just all around, I think it's quite possible that Alabama ends up being better. So you talk about depth, and and, and I do want to touch a little bit on running back and how – you know, a lot of people have killed us in our previews for not putting incoming freshmen on the depth chart and not putting suspected starters on the depth chart that aren't proven guys. Um, and, and guys, this is kind of why we do that. I mean, th- th- there's a reason why, and one, we don't make our own depth charts. Uh, we have to do our own research and, and scramble these together. But two, True freshmen are that. They're unproven. You don't know what's going to happen. You know, uh, Georgia fans are killing us right now because we don't have Zamir White as like the number one everything. uh, And Pickens is the number one everything. But they haven't played it down yet for Georgia. And and do you get the sense that maybe people will put too much stock into incoming guys or unknown guys as maybe the a, a fan sort of comfort blanket of saying okay we might have lost this really get, great guy or we might have this new guy coming in that's going to make us better when in reality we really just don't know certainly uh you know to the there's sort of two sides to this coin right and alabama exemplifies it so there's been two pieces of news in the last 48 hours one as trey sanders running back backup running back goes down uh, foot injury, nobody knows. I think at this point exactly what it is. It could be anything from a Liz Frank to a Achilles tear. I, I don't know, and it seems from what I was reading, it doesn't seem like anyone does. It would be unrealistic for say that Trey Sanders, the five-star true freshman running back, was going to be a dominant kid. Now, from all indications, he's a phenomenal running back. Should be really, really good. But when we're doing these previews in mid-July... I have no reason to know or think that he's going to be, you know, healthy enough to play six weeks into the season. We ha- we don't, or six weeks later when the season starts, excuse me, we don't know if he's going to be healthy after six weeks. And we also don't know what the guys are going to do around him. And you've got all these other returning players that might improve themselves. Uh, Najee Harris was the number one running back recruit in his country. And, you know, he he's probably going to be the guy to start. You know, there's pretty good players in Georgia's roster and, some of them may step up, and some of those experienced guys may step up. I mean, last year, Demetrius Robinson uh, for Georgia is a transfer, like a number one overall receiving prospect. And then what do you have, like a, one reception in the season? It was, it was less than five. So, you know, you can't make an assumption on how good these kids are. I mean, that kid went to Cal, barely did anything, went to Georgia and did nothing else, even as a sophomore. Um, and the flip side to it is the Joshua McMillan example where you've got a guy – that was a returning starter. And the reason we don't like to get too much into depth charts, one, because we're not beat writers and we don't know that much detail in practice. But two, if you're hanging your analysis on a particular player, and I mean, there's one thing to talk about, like the quarterback or the star guy that you know is going to be a really effective producer. But if you're talking about a first-time starter, you know Joshua McMillan's probably lost for the year. And so if we'd made this preview six weeks ago and we talk a lot about McMillan and what he's doing in the linebacker slot or what's happening in the running back position, it's going to be completely worthless come start of the season. So we've tried to focus on the things that we do know are actually going to take place. So talking about the depth chart, one of the players that you mentioned in passing that I want to talk about for a little bit, not the whole video, um, is Tua. And one of the things that frustrated me all season or at the end of the season and whenever I was doing their retrospective is this easy throwaway fan line of, oh, well, he did really good against crappy defenses and sucked against the, against the elite ones. First of all, everybody sucks against elite defenses. That's why they're elite defenses. And second of all, I don't think that's very fair if you're giving – if you're being charitable to one, the fact that he was playing hurt in a lot of these games and two, he actually did pretty well against some of these defenses. I mean, against LSU, he had like seven yards per attempt. He had like a 50 yard run against Auburn, who was a top 15 scoring defense. uh, He put up over 10 yards in attempt, which is ridiculous. They didn't give that up any other time throughout the year. Um, So people forget that because they want to make a point about Tua anyway. So am I crazy here or is there something there that maybe he's a little bit better than people were getting credit for and they're just kind of maximizing the downside without considering the upside? It's all relative, right? Because 
Tua was not as good against elite defenses, but it was partly due to the fact that he torched other defenses to an absurd degree. I mean, the first thing you got to get out of the way is that Tua had the second what, second highest, or I can't remember, highest QB rating, how it turned out. Uh, and it was by battling Kyler Murray at the end of the season in history. So, yeah, he, he relatively struggled against elite defenses, but it's not like he was ever abysmal. I mean, he had a 92 rating against Georgia, which was pretty terrible. But as you said, super, super hurt. And it was clearly affecting him in that game. But outside that, and you know, let's take the Clemson game, for example, okay? 8.7 yards per attempt, 145 QB rating. Trevor Lawrence's season average was 8.3 yards per attempt and 157 QB rating. So I think one of the frustrations we have in trying to deal with fans sometimes is, is just kind of perspective on this. Tua's rough day against Clemson was a higher yard per pass than Trevor averaged on the season, and it was just a slightly the lower QB rating. If if Tua had traded, let's say he trades one interception for a touchdown, he's probably in excess of Trevor Lawrence's season averages, even though they still lose by a significant margin, right? So first, let's kind of get out of the way when we talk about struggling against weak defenses. The second thing I'll say is I think a lot of what happened with Tua against elite defenses last year in terms of how he struggled really probably wasn't as much Tua as it was the offensive style that they were using to play and how Tua was operated. Because with with Tua, he was being asked to do this RPO system, okay? And this is a theory, you know, you and I have been bouncing back and forth a lot this summer. Um, and Alabama had and has top shelf talent at the receiver position. A lot of people have Jerry Judy being the top receiver on the board in the next NFL draft. Uh, I think the other guys, Henry Ruggs, Devonta Smith, and Jalen Waddell are all, you know, first or second day, you know, draft picks, right? I mean, these guys are probably all first three rounds. Um, I think sometimes the other guys don't get enough credit because of how good Judy is. It's quite possible there are multiple first round draft picks. And I do mean that in honesty on that roster. However, when the RPO system, they were asking Tua to do this sort of simple read where he's reading one particular player on the defense, and then he's throwing what was usually a seam route, which he could throw with a lot of accuracy, but there are a couple things that did. One, it let the defense know what the read was going to be. They could anticipate the play call, and they could react to it. It's something Clemson did and Georgia did to tremendous effect, where they basically sort of baited Alabama into certain decisions. Yeah, it's the same thing formationally that Oklahoma tried to do and knew it was coming, and they just didn't have the personnel to stop it. But Clemson and Georgia did. Right. It, it, it Basically, if you were Oklahoma, you couldn't completely give the run because Oklahoma would have been run on for 15 yards of carry in that game, and that's really not an exaggeration if they were dropping linebackers in the passing lanes. Clemson was able to stop Alabama because their defensive line was winning the bounty of scrimmage. That was... You know, sidebar, by the way, generational defensive line. So it, we're we're still fighting the battle with Clemson fans that expect every defensive lineman to be replaced by another, you know, top five draft pick, which is probably not a little realistic. Yeah. And this is not to pick on Clemson fans, but it is true. Um, and this is more, I think, the nature of fandom in general. We've had more comments this year about Clemson fans saying there will be no drop off at their defensive line. Then I can like that. Then I can count, which is crazy to me, and I think kind of does an injustice to the to the massive talent they had going out. Anyway, continue. right. But the point there was they won the line of scrimmage pretty handily, and that what that did is it let them take the linebackers guess where the RPO was going to be and take it away. The problem with this whole scheme is Alabama had a quarterback who, in the past, had shown almost a preternatural ability to find the open man. And he made really quick decisions in his freshman campaign when he was playing part-time and in the national championship game at making things happen. He even did early on in the last year. Um, and you also had wide receivers that many of them are lauded for the route running ability, um, and they're able to get a lot of separation. But now you're asking him to run a simple route on like a seam route. So you've taken away your best skill from your quarterback, and you've taken away your ability of your wide receivers to create separation. And now you're kind of relying on this schematic gimmick to create separation. That opens the door for an elite defense to to compensate in some way to close that door. And now all of a sudden an elite defense can take away something that, you know, th that there's no real way for your quarterback, your receiver to overcompensate. Because if Tua's read is read the linebacker and handoff or throw, and the receiver is running a straight seam, if you've got a Devin White that can drop back in coverage and cover that lane, 
it doesn't really matter how accurate Tua is to a certain extent. It doesn't really matter how good the receiver is and all these attributes. He doesn't have a lane to throw the ball. And and we talk a lot, and we've talked a lot about the, over the past few years about the differences with offenses that create separation in receiving routes and then offenses that are based around, and it's usually spread offenses, either isolation concepts or waiting for a defense to overcompensate in some area. Alabama went toward the latter. I've always said it's a mistake to do that if you're an elite team, especially in my criticisms of the Urban Meyer systems and a lot of the other spread systems, because it tends to be the case where an elite defense can do something schematically to take it away, and all of a sudden your advantages are lost. I think Alabama is going to be better off in a pro-style system where all of a sudden now Tua Tagovailoa can actually read the field where the receivers can create separation organically and make themselves be open so that the defense, like in the Clemson game, isn't able to dictate what the offense does. I, I thought I was kind of astonished. We've gone back and like rewatched the Alabama-Clemson game because we've tried to figure out you know, if we were crazy for having the thoughts we were. One thing that stands out to me in that game is things like there's no receiver screens being thrown. And when you've got what Alabama had this significant perceived talent advantage at the receiver position – and you're not getting the ball quickly to the receivers and letting them operate in space, now all of a sudden that advantage is negated. And there was a lot of stuff in terms of just overall throughout the season where they're not using you know, normal levels concepts and like high load reads. They're not letting Tua you know, and the receiving core put the defense in a bad position, create separation, and make a play. Yeah, there's a lot of criticism. We even had some of this criticism um, of Tua in that he was always looking for the hero shot and that it really, it, it ended up getting him hurt. It ended up, you know, really hurting him towards the end of the season. Um, but when you and I went back and kind of looked at some tape, it looked like he was looking for the hero shot without any kind of underneath option. It was basically like in the, in the Clemson game, they were either running four verts or, running some play just in, to get just enough yardage to get a first down. Did you see kind of the same thing? Right. And there's a, I mean, there were kind of a few aspects to that one, you know, we, it really was just kind of one afternoon. We, we both flipped on the like 20 minutes all to us throws clip that was on YouTube and walked through it and commented as we watched it. But it was astonishing first how many times that Tua had no options that were below the line of scrimmage or below the uh, first down marker. And when you do that, and you kind of take away the ability for your receivers to catch the ball and make a play. And Clemson just sort of dropped coverage and made him have to hold on the ball until a throw was open, but their offensive line really couldn't block that long. Um, The second thing was, as you said, they were constantly trying to kind of get the yardage that they needed for a given drive. And we, you know, we did the break breakdown of the national championship game, and I'm not going to go into a hundred percent repetition of all that because I don't want to waste everybody's time on this. But, it, you know, a couple of random, you know, statistics on this. In the first two drives of the game, Alabama threw the ball on three yards or less to go three times. Um, Alabama was two of three on those occasions. They converted both for third downs for 24 yards. It was about eight yards of play. Okay, so three yards or less, they're throwing the ball. In the next 16 times Alabama faced three yards or less to go, they ran 14 times. They passed twice. Of the two passes, one was the shovel pass that got blown up at the goal line, okay? So essentially, when Alabama was facing third and short, they always ran the ball. So that means all two of his passes, conversely, were in situations where you think Alabama probably will run the ball. And when they were unpredictable, they were pretty successful, but they got extremely predictable. And after the first two drives of the game, every third or fourth down in the entire game with less than four yards to go was a run. Save that one shovel past the goal line. Let me repeat that stat. Every third or fourth down with less than four yards to go in the Alabama Clemson game after the first two scripted drives was a run call. It was one of the most obscenely predictable games from a passing perspective that I've ever seen. And we're saying all this not to beat the Clemson game to death, but to say that there probably is going to be a significant in-game or game planning upgrade at the offensive coordinator position or in that offensive room in general. Because the fact that we're seeing this, even though hindsight's 2020, we're seeing this in, a, in kind of a retrospective, 
the fact that we're seeing this at all shows that there was some kind of something that was lacking. And it showed up just like it kind of showed up uh, Jalen Hurts' freshman year, where once everybody got tape on him, um, the offensive staff failed to react, and it really shut down that offense late in the year. Same thing happened with Alabama. Um, so I, I think we're going to see an upgrade there. Um, okay, so let's talk about the schedule a little bit. Alabama fans are rightly frustrated the national sort of tenor on this i think there's the frustrations fair that the schedule's weak although i will say alabama this year had a lot of what ohio state had in that tcu backed out of a game with ohio state so they went were left scrambling that's why they ended up with cincinnati or they would have had a stronger schedule alabama had some commitments sec acc commitments with the tie-ins um in the peach bowl and so they i think I think what I've heard is Duke was kind of the only team that stepped up to take an L. Um, Clemson already had Texas A&M. They're already playing South Carolina. There's no need for them to play Alabama in the regular season. Um, so I'm not killing them entirely. I am kind of prepping Alabama fans for kind of a boring season, maybe. Um, but we were talking about this before the recording uh, of this show that, you know, we, looking back on last year, we, we thought it was going to be even a better schedule than it turned out to be. Um, there's, there's kind of some similarities, right? There are. Alabama last year on paper looked like they were going to have a pretty decent schedule. The irony was a lot of the teams that were expected to be pretty good weren't necessarily all that great. Louisville, we, we said in their preview, and I'm toot my own horn a little bit, I kind of, you can go back and look at the comment section at how many angry Louisville fans there were because we kind of railed on the fact that there were a lot of markers for how Petrino teams cratered in a certain situation. And we said we thought Louisville under Petrino was probably going to suck last year. Not wrong on that. But, you know, beyond that point, Alabama's real saving grace last season was the Mississippi State team ended up being elite that wasn't expected to be elite. And Auburn wasn't particularly good. The rest of the schedule wasn't particularly good. Louisville was terrible. It, it ended up being kind of overall a really boring early part of the season, really all the way through the Missouri game, which also was a team that really just ended up being ever that good. That game was hyped a lot, and it turned out that it really shouldn't have been. Right, and, and I think maybe the one notable game in the front part of the season was maybe Texas A&M, but yeah. Texas, A yep. Texas A&M's problem last season, and we, we talked about this a lot, their pass defense was in the hundreds. It, it, it was awful. And Texas A&M had a good year because when they played teams that l relied on running the ball, it, be it Kentucky, be it LSU, they looked really good. But when they played a team that could throw the ball on a, more than one occasion, Clemson and Alabama in particular, but those were kind of the two big passing offenses, they got lit up like a Christmas tree. So Alabama just ended up with a backloaded schedule because of how it was, but the rest of the schedule was not nearly as hard as was anticipated. It's kind of funny this year – that I think this schedule is being looked down on more, but I don't think there's any question that Duke is an improvement over Louisville. I mean, I, I don't know that Duke is a major challenge for Alabama. That, that's probably a telling thing for the ACC, given that they're one of the top teams in the conference. But Louisville was one of the worst teams in the ACC, uh, whether you think they're good or bad. Um, Duke is, you know, they're, they're in a rebuilding year. They're probably not going to be as good, but they're still in the upper half, probably the ACC. You have South Carolina in the third week of the season, uh, Texas a and is in the middle of the year in October, LSU in November, uh, ending the year with Auburn. It's a fairly evenly spaced schedule, at least on paper. And I, I think at the end of the day, too, one of these teams may be a lot better than we're expecting like Mississippi State was last season. I think the problem with the Alabama schedule this year, and this has happened to them a couple times in the past, um, there's two teams on their schedule, South Carolina and Texas A&M, who will undoubtedly be better than their record. Now, I'm not saying they're going to be – elite teams or great teams. And when you said elite for Mississippi state, you meant elite unit, not elite team. Um, you don't even have to respond to that. They, they had the, one of the worst offenses in the country, but they had far and away the best defense in the country, better than Alabama, better than Clemson, better than they had the best defense in the country. Um, so a and M is probably going to be a, an 10 and two type team, nine and three type team that might have five losses because their schedule South Carolina is probably a 7-8 win team that's going to go 6-6 six and six at best because they legit have the hardest schedule I've ever seen, ever. So um, that's going to hurt Alabama a little bit where 
in another conference, and this isn't pumping the SEC. This could happen in any conference in, in, in a tough division where if the schedule fell a certain way, where in another conference you might have a team like a Northwestern who wins 10 games and is really a paper tiger or a Pitt who wins a divisional championship but is really not that great. They lose to a PSU 51-6, to Penn State, uh, you know, whatever. Um, so I think some of that's going to happen, but I also think LSU is going to be good. And I think when we talk about Alabama, it's fair to say the path to the playoffs. And the path to the playoffs generally is for Alabama going through the SEC championship game. Now, if they play in a really strong division and everybody else around them loses a game to, you know, Purdue or Iowa State or whatever, then they might get in without winning their division. But this year, this is probably one of those times where they have to win their division to get in the playoffs. And that includes or will include a legitimate top five opponent in the SEC championship game. Whereas in the Pac-12, you might be able to win your conference without playing a top five team all year. Same thing with the Big 12. I think it's going to be Texas and Oklahoma and that's it. So ACC, the same way. So for everybody that's killing Alabama about their schedule, I think it's fair to note to get to the playoffs, they're going to have to beat at least two teams who, if they had an easier schedule, would be in the top five, top three at the end of the year regardless. Is that fair to say? It is. And we've talked about this a lot of different ways. And again, I'm always kind of hesitant to say too much because I feel like it's going to be taken as some sort of you know massive pro SEC sentiment just because that's where the ships fall right now. We get a little too caught up sometimes in talking about teams being ranked because their record is good simply because they didn't play the better teams in the conference, right? Conferences go 500 against themselves every year. I'm going to say this as many videos as possible until it gets in certain people's heads. The SEC this year has their best teams playing each other a lot. And what that means is they have to go 500 against each other. It's going to be hard for those teams to have really good records. When you look at Texas A&M schedule, they play Alabama, they play Georgia, they play LSU, they play Clemson. In a lot of power rankings, that's number one, number two, number three, and number four. I think that's number one through four in FPI. South Carolina, they have to play Florida. They have to play Georgia. They have to play Alabama. They have to play Texas A&M. They have to play Clemson. You can play in that these kind of schedules. You can have t- only lose to top ten teams and go seven and five. And the problem is they could be a top 15 team, only lose to teams they should lose to as a top 15 team, only teams that other top 15 teams would lose to every time, And they're going to be unranked because they're seven and five. I personally have never liked that. I like comparing teams based off, you know, if they're seven and five against this schedule, my my way of looking at it is, okay, this other team that's 10 and two, based off how they did in their two losses and 10 wins, how would they have done with the same schedule? Um, And I, I think that's going to negatively impact Alabama because they're going to be, they're not going to have as many quote ranked teams because the SEC is going to beat itself up. All right, so we've talked about the schedule a little bit. Let's go ahead and wrap this up and talk about how we think Alabama is going to do this year. I will start. Um, we did a little quick hitter segment already on the late kick, uh, kind of a collab we did with them. And, you know, if you're not watching the late kick with Josh Pate, it's got a great YouTube channel, does a ton of content, almost like RJ Young level, churning out content every day type of thing, does a lot of live stuff. Y'all should definitely check him out. Late kick with Josh Pate. Um, and I said 12-0 and 0 for Alabama. This was pre-Trey Sanders and Josh McMillan injury. I'm still saying 12-0 and 0 for Alabama. Um, I, I don't think that I don't think that anybody's going to match their talent level. Um, I, I do think that they're they're going to run into a tougher game with LSU this year, even though that they get LSU and Tuscaloosa. I think LSU is going to be better this year. Um, but We've seen pissed off Alabama, and I don't know that we've ever seen pissed off Alabama not be just on it. And we've got pissed off Alabama with a returning all-everything quarterback Um, and a lot of key players on the defensive side of the ball coming back. If you insert Terrell Lewis and Chris Allen or any kind of pass-rushing threat in the game against Clemson, it changes the dynamic. I still think you have Ter- Terrell Lewis or Christian Miller without the injury. I still think if you have a good pass rusher on that defense, 
Clemson probably still wins the game, but it looks a whole lot different. Um, when you have a super clean pocket and you're, you are an elite quarterback and you can throw all day long, it changes the game. Teams aren't going to have that against Alabama this year. Now, my caveat is they've got to stay healthy now at this point at inside linebacker and running back. They really have zero room, no margin, unless one of these true freshmen really step up, which might be the case. But either way, I'm not predicting the postseason. That's too far in theory. That's too far down the line. But right now, 12-0 and Alabama, and I don't think they're going to have a lot of scares this year. Maybe one, but I, I don't see anybody getting real close to them. Uh, I think it's Alabama, Clemson. I tend to agree with you. Uh, we had the same sort of discussion. We were talking about Georgia, and we've hinted around it if I haven't said it directly. I lean towards Alabama going 12-0 and again. Let, let's keep in mind, Alabama's gone 12-0 and for two of the past three years. If you listen to our channel, you know my opinion on these things tends to be if I see somebody doing something continually, then I'm going to kind of expect them to take the same route. And Alabama is, in recent years, they're either going undefeated or they're taking one loss. When I look at their schedule, we say this a lot in terms of strength of schedule ratings, right? That you know they can be either about how hard it is to make a bowl or how hard it is to go undefeated. Alabama's schedule is hard to make a bowl. Alabama's schedule is not really necessarily particularly hard to go undefeated in a lot of ways. I agree with you that I think the LSU game, right now I would say it's like 60-40, 65-35, Alabama over LSU. And you think, it's easy for me to say, well, the percentages say they'll probably lose a game otherwise. But I think they pretty consistently beat everybody else on their schedule, frankly. I mean, it may be one of these other teams surprises me. And I fully have the right to to revise this sentiment three weeks into the season. But right now, like South Carolina, Texas A&M, Auburn, Mississippi State, they've all got significant holes on some section or another. A&M may be in their own way the most complete team, but they're not a consistent one. So when I look at all those teams, I'm seeing like a top 25-ish team, you know, top 20, top 25. And top 20, top 25 is going to find it very, very, very difficult to beat Alabama. Um, maybe they make it a close game, but it's going to be hard as heck for them to actually win. You really need to be a top five, top 10 team to beat someone as talented as Alabama is right now, or for example, like Clemson. Um, Alabama doesn't lose to bad teams. They just don't. And they don't lose to mediocre teams. You, You have to be very good. And LSU can do it. I'm not seeing anybody else on their schedule. And again, it's a schedule a lot of teams that have a hard time going nine and three or 10 and two with. But for an Alabama, this is actually a pretty navigable schedule to go undefeated. Yeah, and honestly, like we always, we've been saying in a lot of these previews, they're going to go ten and two or eleven and one, and we don't know which one it is. I'm saying right now, if Alabama loses a game in the regular season, it's LSU, um, because I don't see, like you said, I think there's holes on every other, you know, every, every other game down the line, and you know, this isn't two years ago, Alabama that almost lost to Mississippi state before they ultimately lost to Auburn where they were absolutely decimated with injuries and had a pretty pedestrian offensive attack. This is last year, Alabama that set a a college football record in terms of how many people they beat by 20 points or more. So this is that team with all the guys back that were hurt essentially. Um, and pissed off. And if DJ Dale is hurt, y'all, that is is come back. He's hurt right now. If he comes back from, from injury and is healthy, he's the guy to watch this year. Um, he, I said this even before Trey Sanders. DJ Dale is going to be, as a freshman, an absolute dominant force. Y'all watch there's some video floating around of him just in practice, and 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 it's 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 scary. Um I think that's pretty much it for us. Uh, I, I did mention that I think Alabama and Clemson played again in the playoffs. I will say that Georgia is another one of those teams that I think we, we have some question marks, wide receiver, maybe front seven. We have some question marks with Georgia, but Georgia, if they get to the SEC championship game with just one loss, then they're still in the playoff hunt, and that's absolutely a team that could give Alabama everything they wanted and beat them. So I don't, Georgia fans, I'm not writing your team off yet. That's that's postseason. That's down the line. We'll, we'll, we'll cast that later. Um, anything else from you before we wrap up this one that went longer than we said it would? <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. As you said, one, injuries can always affect every team to, you know, it, to any extent, 
feasible. Um, Alabama has reliable depth, I think, at most positions this year, uh, but certainly injuries that they've t- suffered have already affected them. Uh, I'll also say you you brought up TJ Dale, but I, I had from pretty reliable sources last season that Terrell Lewis was going to be one of the breakout players in college football. And, and you know, until proven otherwise, I have to assume that getting him back may be a really notable thing in terms of a guy that kind of got forgotten because he missed all of last season with an injury. All right, everybody, that's our Alabama preview for the 2019 football season. 12-0 and or bust for Alabama. I think that's the case. Let us know in the comments where they lose. If you think they're going to lose, also please remember to subscribe. Richard, remember to hit the notification bell because you missed all of our videos that we put out this summer. Uh, Thanks so much, y'all. Have a great week, and God bless.